Hello everyone, I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borosh and today I'm going to show you how the Queen's Gambit helped me achieve my Grandmaster title. So this game is played against Flumbort, a rival who was also trying to get a Grandmaster title in this event, so it was especially crucial to have a good showing. So as you've seen in the Beth Harmon Borgov game, there followed d4, d5, c4, d takes c4, and e4 was played, and knight c6. However, my opponent chose a different variation, and instead of that, decided to go for knight f3, knight f6, c4, d takes c4, and we are back on track in the queen's gambit. e3, e6, bishop c4, c5. So what is black really trying to do? So black voluntarily gives up a center pawn, but in return is trying to put pressure on white's center. Castles, knight c6, a move that I really much like as it puts extra pressure on the d4 pawn. Knight c3, bishop e7, making sure that my king gets into safety. Queen e2, c takes d4, rook d1. A very, very good move by my opponent, who is a very well-known theoretician. Now, after castles, he gets the extra move and possibility of taking with the knight. The other continuation is to take with the pawn, and then we get into a typical IQP that is an isolated pawn position, where this pawn is a little weak. However, it does threaten to push on through and give good counterplay against black's passive pieces. And it all turns into a big fight after knight a5, chasing the bishop away, stopping d5, bishop d3, b6. However, my opponent decided to go for knight takes d4. And as I have less space and this bishop on c8 is still a little bit passive, I decided to exchange on d4, e takes d4, and seeing that this d5 move is incoming, I said, okay, there's no way I can allow that, so I'm just going to play knight d5. It does cost the pawn, but if my opponent takes, he takes d5, queen e7, bishop d7, it is not that meaningful because after bishop c6, I have the stronger bishop, and as we all know from opposite colored middle games, the stronger bishop and the one who has the attack, that's what counts and not the quantity of the pawn. So I wasn't really scared of this one and felt quite safe after playing knight d5, making sure there is no knight d5, e takes d5, and there is no d5 break, of course. Queen e4, my opponent is insistent on putting pressure on the knight, forcing it away so he can push d5. Knight takes c3, bc, queen c7. I couldn't go bishop d7 right now because the pawn on b7 would be hanging. So queen c7, attacking my opponent's bishop and defending the b7 pawn. So far so good. I have everything in order. My king is safe. Still, my bishop on c8 is a little passive. Bishop d3. And here comes the big question. How to actually deal with this situation? And here's the answer. If I go g6, then there is this idea of bishop h6. And my king is going to face big troubles on the king side. So I decided, hey, after bishop d3, I should just go f5. Yes, that will weaken that pawn on e6. However, it closes down this battery forever. That's never going to happen. And meanwhile, I do have my own targets on my opponent's queen side. We need to bishop d6. Setting up my own battery and also winking at the c pawn. Bishop c4, bishop takes h2, king h1, bishop d6. It's never too late to go wrong, because if I go king h8 now, just trying to sidestep this, then I might face g3 and this bishop would get trapped over there in h2, as it cannot escape those pawns on f2 and g3. So I decided to go back, bishop takes e6, bishop takes e6, queen e6, king h8. And to summarize the situation, I was quite happy. My opponent has lost a very important pawn on h2 
and I only lost a pawn that I didn't care for in the first place. Not to mention, I will have plenty of targets on the face of those hanging pawns. Rook b1, b6, making sure I have no weaknesses while I can probe against that pawn. Rook e1, f4. Setting up the idea of rook f6, rook h6, and going against that king. Bishop d2, f3. Just trying to open it up in front of the king and also putting pressure on the f2 pawn. Rook e4, rook f6, queen h3, queen f7. Rook h4 and my opponent, to his credit, is trying to put pressure on my h2 pawn that looks a little bit loose over there. However, it does turn out that my play is stronger. So here I took king g1 and here I came up with a brilliant, brilliant idea. First off, I thought, hey, I could go h6, but then I realized sometimes my opponent can even sacrifice. And as this bishop on d6 is a little bit loose, that is not going to bode well for me. But then I realized, hey, if I could just defend this pawn on h7, that would be perfect as I already have my own threats on f2. So I came up with the idea of playing g5, hitting that rook on h4, defending the h7 pawn and attacking the f2 pawn simultaneously. And now black is actually overtaking a white. So bishop d takes g5 was played. But if my opponent chooses rook h6, I have this gorgeous idea of taking queen takes h6, rook f8, pressing on f2. So you have no time of taking because I take king and I check and promote. So instead, my opponent has to defend with bishop e3, but then I have this beautiful move of bishop g3. If you go rook b2, just defending the pawn, then I have queen f3, and I will be overwhelming that king on g1. But after f takes e3, f takes g3, that is, I have this gorgeous idea of queen f1 check, king h2, Rook e8, a beautiful, beautiful move. Just saying, you have nothing better. I am going to take your bishop or your rook later. And after queen g5, queen takes b1, is winning. As after queen f6, here, bishop h6, there is a chance of coming back or just promoting. And again, the two queens are too much for white to handle. So my opponent decided to take on g5. Rook takes f2. Rook h7 takes, takes here, king f2. And already I was quite optimistic as I saw the finishing touch. As I have rook g8, if the bishop moves, I have bishop h2 and I'm promoting. So my opponent had to play rook b5, but I knew that this pawn is not captured yet. And after bishop f4, I'm setting up a deadly idea as once you take on f4, I am promoting on that square and I'm winning. So my opponent had no choice but to take, but now I am up a piece. It's still a little bit tricky because we have reduced material, but after king g6, king e4, b5, I fix this pawn on c3, and after king d5, bishop d2, c4 takes. King takes c4, king f6, my king is coming closer, but first of all for my opponent, I have the right colored bishop on d2, which matches with this one, if it would be this color, it would be a draw, but it matches with that dark color. So this is just winning. King d5, bishop e3, a4, king f5, a5, bishop f2. And here my opponent resigned, basically making sure that there is no way out. As after king c4, I have king e4, and eventually I'm going to win the d pawn and the a pawn, and that is a technically winning endgame. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture on how the Queen's Gambit actually had me become a Grandmaster. I hope you enjoyed this time listening. And if you have any thoughts, comments, please leave the message below. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and have a good night. Bye-bye.